No, it's okay. And I, I have sensitivity for those trying to sit down. <laughs> Thank you for your intention and efforts. All right. Well, I might begin an, a minute intro, yeah. and then that's great. Okay. So, the, in uh, the flow of the theme of the day, where we describe an issue and then we describe grassroots response, uh, we are our two issue sharers today. Are, we are so pleased to have. I am very grateful for the partici participation of Gopal Dayani. Uh, and Dana Pearls. Uh, Gopal and I met at Sin Bio Watch, which, um, or it was, it was actually, it was a series, a speaking series. Vandana Shiva and Ignacio Chapella and yourself, and you were the moderator for scientific community folk to come together um, and civil society groups to talk about new technologies and um, our our decision-making frameworks or lack thereof around how new technologies are coming down pipelines. And um, I was just so pleased with your approach and the equity framework that you come from. And I'm very thankful for your participation today with this group. So um, we're going to kick it off with Gopal. And I don't know if I'll have time to intro Dana in between, so I'm going to do that now. So Dana and I have just met recently and had time on the phone together. Dana Pearl is with Friends of the Earth, and there's a few organizations that are working to help the general public understand um, what is coming down the pipeline for food and fiber systems related to new technologies. And we're just, again, very grateful for the role that these two individuals play in our community to help us learn more um, and entertain new possibilities through our increased understanding and increased knowledge base, which both of them help us to grow and expand. So um, I'll leave it there and go, Paul, would you like to start? Okay, thank you. <laughs> and this, this Great. And um, I'm assuming the right button moves us to the it next should. slide. Great. Um, I'm gonna try and follow the instructions about keeping my mouth close to the mic. And uh, um, hello, my name is Gopal Dianeni. I'm with, um, I'm here representing two organizations. I'm with Movement Generation Justice and Ecology Project. Um, our organization works at the intersection of racial, economic, social justice issues and, and um, ecology and ecological systems thinking. Our vision is to realign the movement, stra movement strategy with the healing powers of Mother Earth. And so I'm excited to be here with y'all. I'm also part of an organization called the Etc. Group, ETC, which stands for Erosion, Technology, and Corporate Concentration. Um, and we look at the relationship between technology as a tool to catalyze corporate concentration and the ecological and social erosion that results from it, which unfortunately is why I'm here today. Um, where um, Dana and I are gonna talk a little bit about synthetic biology and its um, relationship to fiber and transforming the fiber industry. I wanna start, um, let's see if that's, that's the little opening slide. Um, I want to start by just saying, um, at Movement Generation, we're really interested in this idea of just transition. What does it look like to transition from an extractive economy that's based on um, the exploitation of land, labor, and life ways um, to um, a, a regenerative or resilient economy that's based on living in right relationship with each other and, um, and the, 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 um, the, the world upon which we depend? All wealth is generated through the work of the living world. That's where all wealth comes from. Those of you who are farmers and weavers um, know that, understand that very well. And it is through um, extraction that we, um, we both erode the living systems upon which we depend, and we erode our ability to be whole human beings and whole communities in connection with those living systems. And one of the enabling technologies that we believe right now is driving some of that erosion is synthetic biology. Um, 
what is synthetic biology? I'm going to skip that slide, and I'm going to go to some um, a basic idea, which is um, used to be that you know life happened um, the old-fashioned way. Um, and then we started getting into you know, genetic modification where we'd splice um, living things together, maybe put um, a salmon gene in a tomato or, or the other way around. And now, so there was sex and then there was splicing and now we're in a, in a phase of, uh, of synthesizing where we produce entirely novel DNA and um, using various technologies, one of which is called a gene gun, we inject it into um, uh, another life form, usually a yeast or a microbe, so that it does industrially produ uh, produces industrially useful materials. So we're shackling microbial life to an industrial platform to produce materials for us, whether that's pharmaceuticals or fuels or fragrances. And Dana's going to get really deeply into that, but I just wanted to give put it in the context of the old school way, nature's way, um, the 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 forced fit, and then um, now we have an end run around um, around nature. Um, uh, oh, so the promise, the promise is that, um, and we hear this a lot in these biotechnologies, like we will be able to make everything using these new technologies. We're going to have super clean um, materials. Um, they're, they claim to be environmentally sustainable. Um, they often compare it to the petroleum industry, like getting off of fossil fuels and getting on um, um, biological platforms. Um, and um, I'm going to um, not read this, but I'm instead going to show you a little video about the promise. Oh, wait, that's backwards. Okay. <laughs> about the promise. Uh, you know, I just gave away the punchline. Um, which is, this is a video from Fidelity Investments. It's, a, it's several years old, but you'll recognize some interesting references to, um, to fiber in here also. And I just want to give you a taste of what's behind all this. There are 1.7 million known species of life on Earth. Two years ago, scientists introduced the first one ever designed by a computer. And in the last 10 years, there have been over 3,000 patents issued for genetically modified organisms and other transgenic innovations. Within 50 years, we could have more life forms invented in the lab than we've ever identified in nature. We now have goats, whose milk can be spun into spider silk that's stronger than steel. Jumbo salmon that grow twice as fast as their natural cousins. Bacteria that produce anti-malarial drugs once available only from plants. Innovations like these can increase the supply of essential products, inspire new investing ideas, and launch or upend entire industries. It's all part of a new science called synthetic biology, using nature as a manufacturing platform and DNA as the raw material. Pharmaceutical companies see it as a pipeline for extraordinary new drugs and treatments. Energy companies see a route to cleaner, more sustainable fuels, like algae that produce biofuels and eat carbon dioxide. Someday, computers may run on DNA-based circuits, and biological paint could help heat and cool your home. Around the world, across borders, academics, entrepreneurs, and even students are working with over 5,000 DNA sequences called biobricks to explore ideas and invent new organisms. The DNA is available online in an open source database and a collaborative crowdsourced approach means experiments that used to take years now take weeks, constantly redefining what's possible. Although synthetic biology is still in a very early experimental phase, it could become the defining technology of the 21st century bringing with it radical new thinking, new questions, and new opportunities. Because nothing has the power to change how we live more than changing life itself. Think about it. We do. So, um, you know, there are things about that that seem really cool, like, oh my god, look, we can, we can get, get off of fossil fuels and have clean fuels, and we can have pharmaceuticals that once you could only get from plants. 
Um, the example there that they didn't mention is artemisinic acid, which uh, artemisinin, which is the primary anti-malarial drug on the planet, which is um, grown from sweet wormwood, which primarily is grown by small farmers throughout the world. Um, and now one pharmaceutical company can make the entire world supply of artemisinic acid in a microbial vat in Hungary for pennies on the dollar. Um, so we're wiping out livelihoods, and which is what gets us to where we are here in terms of just transition. Like there are real solutions and there are false solutions. And the idea of relocalizing our fiber shed, like shed-based thinking, food sheds and trade sheds and water sheds and fiber sheds, is a way to reimagine our relationship to the living world and each other, to short chain and known chain our relationships. Um, or we could have these kinds of um, solutions that advance greater and greater corporate consolidation and vertical integration, that wipe out the small farmer, that wipe out people who are actually trying to do right by the living world and each other. Um, and so I like to think of this as a wolf in sheep's clothing, um, which I thought would be funny in this group. I don't know. I just thought it would go over well. Um, uh, and. Um, and that, that, I think, is like at the heart of it f for us. Um, I have a whole bunch of other things that I could, um, I could mention, but I, I want to leave you with, um, with an idea, which is uh, you know, Dana was, um, we're really good friends, by the way, and Dana was noticing that there are a bunch of people weaving, you know, knitting in the audience. And we have an expression in Movement Generation, which is what the hands do, the heart learns. That if all we do is fight against what we don't want, we'll learn to love the fight and we'll have nothing left for our vision but longing, and longing isn't good enough. And the idea that, that the first rule of ecological restoration is the restoration of our labor back into the web of life, and that to see that this is a room full of farmers and weavers and folks who are pragmatically trying to figure out the right answer to meeting our fiber needs in a way that, that actually leans into the way we used to do it, that helps us remember our way forward, and that we're actually, that you're pragmatically practicing that, that is what the just transition is. That's what it means to get out of a death-dependent economy into an economy in which people can share ownership and can live in equitable relationships with each other. And I would argue that these enabling technologies that promise us better products are doing so through a process that erodes our actual relationships to each other. I mean, this entire video was based on the assumption that DNA is code, right? It used to be that life was the metaphor for everything, and now machines are the metaphor for life. We talk about DNA as code. We talk about our minds as being wired. We talk about our children as 2.0. That is not the world we want to live in, and that will not get us to where we need to be. But the world in which you put your hands in the soil and develop meaningful relationships with the microbial life that way, rather than shackling them to an industrial platform, that is the way forward. And that's why I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Um, let's see. Those are go pulse slides. Yo, you skip, you skip the rest of my slides. That was if I had 20 minutes. <laughs> okay. So, okay, great. My name is Dana Pearls, and I'm here with Friends of the Earth. Um, as Rebecca said, I focus predominantly on biotechnology and the applications to agriculture, looking at what are the risks and the concerns, not just for our individual health, but environment, ecosystems, and people. What are the socioeconomic systems um, and, the, and the impacts on those? Um, so I am going to um, start off um, well, first of all, thank you. I, I haven't been in this community before. I mostly focus on food. Um, so it's a real honor to be here. Um, and thank you, Gopal, for really framing it. Uh, Gopal has really looked at the, the solution and the, and the way forward that you all are part of. And now I'm going to take you um, into a deeper dive of what is the problem that, that, that I and others are trying to keep at bay so that y'all can step in more fully into the solution, right? So um, Gopal painted this crossroads that we're at in our agricultural system where we have this opportunity to fight for a healthy and regenerative democratic agricultural system, a local fiber 
fiber shed. Um, and now what we have is a new GMO fight. This is genetic engineering. Um, it's the next generation of genetic engineering. Sometimes we call it synthetic biology, but it is genetic engineering. And I'm not talking about labeling. I'm talking about now a fight to preserve ecosystems, to fight corporate consolidation, and protecting livelihoods. So this, is this working? I'm going to just tell you this whole platform, and then we'll get into specifics. This is not just about seeds and corn and soy. Um, this ranges from pharmaceuticals, from um, designer babies, to biofuel that's made in big open vats of algae in the deserts, uh, to sterile insects. Is that going to? Sterile insects and DNA spray to modify plants. Um, this is something like BioDirect that uh, Monsanto is, is using. Um, and applications in agriculture, right, from lab to fork. So replacing plants and animals um, it, with, with, with lab-based ingredients, unprecedented control and patenting of seeds, new types of DNA sprays. Um, so that's kind of the overall um, the broad platform that we're talking about. So the, the GMO fight is changing. Um, and so how does it work? If you think about uh, first generation genetic engineering, you swap genes from one organism into another. Um, but now synthetic biologists draw from a variety of approaches that involve creating new genetic material like DNA from scratch. Um, and they refer to this as reprogramming, as Gopal said, um, kind of this machine metaphor. So, for example, the way that you would sit down at a computer and write a sentence, you, this is one example, you could sit down at a processor, a DNA processor, type out a, a sentence, um, print, print out the amino acids, and then you insert it into a simple organism like yeast or algae. You ferment it using GMO corn or sugar, or in some cases, methane gas, um, and then out comes some product that you have prescribed it to do, like synthetic biology vanillin, or yeast, or spider silk, or um, different algal oils, coconut oils, the lubricants for industrial uses. The list really goes on and on. And, and the other examples include silencing genes, adding genes, cutting, rearranging genes, really um, it's, it's a lot of movement. Um, but the, the thing to know is that the science of genetics is so complex. It is not a one-for-one -one circuit. And we are um, playing around with the technology without fully understanding the consequences. And yet, these applications are already entering the environment and they're already on the market. Um, there's another type of technology I'm not going to get into, it's similar to the genetic engineering, it's the opposite extreme, or just at far end of the extreme, um, which is the gene drive. And this is an extinction technology designed to pass traits down through generations until a species is completely wiped out or redesigned. So um, this, uh, the idea is that you could insert, let's say you have a fly with yellow eyes, and you drop one yellow fly yellow-eyed fly into a population, and within a couple generations, all the flies around the world will have yellow eyes. So you could design a seed, so it's only going to be susceptible to your pesticide. You could design a rat, which is going to wipe out all rat populations. Again, this is this idea that we are going to design nature to fit our industrial needs, but in this time where we have climate chaos, we actually need agricultural systems that are more flexible and that have more genetic diversity and, and not less. So these are some of the companies that are funding um, synthetic biology. One of the ones that's missing and a big funder is DARPA, which is the specialized unit uh, that's part of the Department of Defense. Um, DARPA funds almost all the different Symbio projects, not all of them, but most of them. Um, and as I said, we are unleashing technologies with very few ideas about the consequences. Um, the way that these organisms will interact with the environment are unpredictable, and they are potentially um, devastating and permanent. Um, this is not 
not something that we have seen before. Um, so contamination is a really big, uh, big issue. Um, these new genetic engineered organisms are uncontainable and could cause ripple effects in ways we don't know. How will they affect pollinators? What happens when the organisms start to mutate and evolve? Um, you know, we heard earlier about the small fibers of fabrics contaminating oceans and waters. So what is the impact of genetically engineered fibers in our water system and in our, in our uh, ecosystem? Um, again, biology is not a predictable engineering discipline. Uh, the agricultural impacts um, are, are huge with the loss of seed diversity. Again, we need secure food systems, especially in a very climate um, uncertain future, and that requires maximum diversity, not less for resilience. Um, and I just want to say that this is, this is, not, this is not a sustainable um, form of production. Um, Many of the symbioorganisms organisms that we're seeing hit the market right now require sugar, generally GMO corn, to feed the yeast as if you were brewing. And these are industrial heavy, chemical intensive, water intensive monocrops um, that we know are far from sustainable. So really we need to look holistically at what is sustainable. Um, oh gosh, okay, we're gonna skip to the fibers. This is the impossible burger, don't eat it. Um, <laughs> Spiber, so what are, what are some of the things we're seeing? We're seeing this hit the world of fiber in a major way. There's AMS silk that's making, quote, bio steel fiber, uh, bolt threads, partnering with Patagonia, Spiber, Biocraft Labs. There's Colorfix making synthetic biology dyes, Modern Meadow, which is making ZOA, a biofabricated um, leather. There's also synthetic biology hemp. Um, and these are being made in different ways, but ultimately this idea of genetically engineering microorganisms like yeast or um, uh, enzymes and then producing the, the, the products that way. It also um, goes to animals themselves. So there's the ge uh, genetically engineered cows, the glow-in-the-dark sheep, uh, the GMO sheep, um, and, and really we're moving from, from the farms in this model into the, into the labs. Um, and I just want to also say in my last second um, that there's a lot of false marketing, a lot of false marketing. Um, the AMS silk, which is derived from GMO biopolymers, is calling it silk organic high performance material. Um, but there's nothing organic, I would argue, about feeding genetically engineered yeast a bunch of GMO corn and then squeezing out silk in a vat. Um, Colorfix uses GMO enzymes, and it says that all the process is sustainable um, and, and efficient. Bolt Thread says it's 100% spider silk made with programmatical, programmable uh, technology. But I would question what is it that we call 100% spider silk? Is it uh, the footprint of a DNA, or is it actually real? What is natural? Um, so these are questions that we need to ask as well as where the funding is coming from when somebody says to you this is sustainable, this is real, this is good for the earth. If we think back about the funding, we would need to question since when does Shell have our best interests in mind? Since when is Monsanto going to feed the world? Um, spider Thread has been heavily funded by DARPA using your tax dollars. Um, Bolt gets its funding, some of its funding from Nanfeng which is a conglomerate conglomerate whose tax dollars paved the way for a lot of Chinese capital investments, that's not local, right? So if we're talking about local fiber sheds, then we need to think about how these technologies are not actually democratic, but rather pave the way for more corporate consolidation, pave the way to move from the fields, from the places that we need to nurture for life, um, and, and, and into the labs. Um, and I'm out of time, but I do want to say that we are working on solutions for the, like to, to, to keep this at bay. I skipped over some regulatory slides that we're working at the regulatory level. There's um, This is more for the food industry, but working with big companies companies to um, work through their supply chain and make sure that they're not inadvertently, unknowingly using symbio ingredients and that they know what they are. Um, and our colleagues over at ETC Group, where Gopal is also part of, um, have put together this amazing database of symbio ingredients where you can look up what's out there based on like a common name. You could look up hemp and then you'll see, oh wow, there's a symbio hemp and it'll tell you all about it. So this is a great resource as well. I was super light, lightning speed. And um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> So 
I think we have how much for questions? Three minutes? Five minutes? Three. Okay. So we'll just field <coughs> questions. Or maybe you're all stunned into silence. <laughs> There's a question right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so Patagonia, is it Spiber or is it? Um, they have network with Bolt. Yeah, so Patagonia has started working with Bolt Threads, which is a synthetic biology company making um, synthetic biology um, silk, spider silk, uh, out of genetically modified yeast um, fed with GMO corn. So I don't know how pervasive it is in their products, um, but. I think that's a, there's an opportunity there if, if Patagonia is trying to be a model of sustainability and, um, and <coughs> healthy fibers. Yeah. Do you know of any funding, big funders or funding sources for the companies that are actually um, <coughs> trying to be at the table as an alternative? Like I would say Microworks is one that actually is regeneratively designed. Um, that's, they're growing uh, leather out of mycelium. Do you know of any large funding bodies that um, can support things that are actually, I mean, obviously the fiber <coughs> shed is the best, and you know there are other companies that are better than Synbio that are at the table in conversations with both, but aren't just, just are not as funded as. Um, I, I don't, but actually finance is a really huge, it's one of the things that we work on also at Movement Generation. Um, and, the, you know, the very nature of finance is part of the problem, the, the current nature of finance is part of the problem. So one of the things that we work on, and I've actually mentioned this to Rebecca, is capitalization is a key barrier to, um, to the kind of work that you're all doing. Obviously, these industries are heavily subsidized. They're, I mean, they're subsidized through everything from um, direct you know, tax subsidies and DARPA funding to war, right? There's all kinds of ways that we're subsidizing industrial agriculture. There's all kinds of ways we're subsidizing it. And um, one of the things that we're trying to do is build um, commons of capital, so non-extractive revolving loan funds for community and worker-owned enterprises and even producer-owned, like, pr producer um, uh, cooperatives that so that folks can actually finance actual solutions that are based in community and that are sustainable and where the wealth stays in the community. Um, in terms of large-scale investment in these kinds of things, like you do have the problem that if you've got, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to give away, you stole it. Like, that's where that wealth comes from, right? No, that's, it's extracted wealth. So the very nature of finance right now is, is, a, is a real problem. Barrier. Yeah. Okay, one more. Yeah. Dan, Mr. Dan? Okay, sure. Hi. That last, your previous slide should, um, yes, I just wanted, that went by so fast, I just wanted. Sure, that says uh, database.symbio, oh, database.symbiowatch.org. Yeah, you can go ahead and look it up. issue in a, in a particular ecosystem at any point that, that can be, can be uh, demonstrate the, uh, the downside of it mm -hmm. at this point. I mean, it's probabilistic, but how about yeah. yeah, there's, I mean, there are actual, it, it, there are interesting ways to answer that question. So one is um, the, the destruction of livelihoods of folks who are um, make, producing materials, producing things that normally are produced by plants, whose livelihoods are being eroded and um, by, by, um, by substitution with synthetic biology ingredients. Vanillin is one. The other is, um, is sweet wormwood, which is where we get our artemisinin, our anti-malarial drugs. So when you start to destroy livelihoods of folks, and you see this in the global south, of farmers in the global south, um, you start to have 
huge implication. That is, an ecolo that is a form of ecological erosion, right? Social inequity is a form of ecological erosion. You displace people off the land, you destroy their livelihoods. So that's, that's one way to think about it. The other way to think about it is actually where the microbial factories get built and where these industries are moving. So there's, you see it in Brazil, you see these large microbial factories in Brazil that have ecological consequences. You see an increased demand for, um, for industrial corn or now, when because of fracking and gas got really cheap, the use of the substitution of sugar with methane in these processes, so using methane. So if you think of it from a very micro standpoint, you can point at some things, but if you actually do what you all are trying to do at Fibershed, which is step back and look at whole systems and look at supply chains, you can start to see where you can, you know, they want to show the product and say the product is really great, but when you step back and look at the process, you see all kinds of ecological and social destruction. Right now, what's happening with gene drives is population scale engineering, and if they deploy, for example, these uh, mosquitoes with gene drives in them, they will eradicate entire populations. It's, it's population scale engineering. And, and there's talk about doing this with mice on, uh, on um, the Fairlawns and things like that. So there's, there is, some of the uh, uh, upcoming experiments have large, potential large-scale consequences. I would suggest that Percy Smyser's battle with Monsanto is more than his question, where they affected his crops. That's right. And yeah. he then was successful in suing them. And so there is history of GMO modification going on into the environment, where it was applied to its military Thank you. Thank you for having us.